Welcome back to Talking Story. I am, I'm in two places because I'm beside myself. That I am here with, I, look, it's it's not hyperbole to say you're one of the pillars uh, of, of this genre that we love, uh, fantasy, and I cannot believe that you are here talking with me, Janny. And above and beyond that, I've seen you on other streams and you're just, you're like my spirit animal when it comes to artistic creativity and just life in general. And I always, after I've listened to you on someone's channel, I always just walk away feeling like I the world looks different to me. So I can't thank you enough for giving me a little bit of your time tonight. Well, I'm privileged to be invited to your high energy growing channel. <laughs> yeah, I, I hi you well, yeah. I guess I'm pretty high energy. I'm 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 pretty excitable. So I'm going to start off with the same question I always start off with every guest. When was it that you got the calling? When did you know that you wanted to be a storyteller? And I know you work in a couple different mediums, so I'm really interested to hear this story. Well, I didn't start off with that idea, but I've always been attracted to storytelling because I did everything along the lines of reading books and drawing pictures which were always narrative. Mm -hmm. And when I did music, it was always bar ballads, which were narrative storytelling. Mm -hmm. Always attracted to poetry, always attracted to... But I felt like that was something that wasn't legitimate in this world. Really? Yeah, because how, I was brought up how? to believe, you know, you had to go into the sciences or you had oh. to do something serious or you had to... So I went to college and I yeah. set off um, to test the waters of the sciences, and I tested marine biology and astronomy and um, oceanography. And I realized very, very quickly that I just wasn't going to fit in that tight of a box. Mm -hmm. Because the minute I would have questions that lay outside those areas of expertise, mm -hmm. I was told, you can't do that. Mm -hmm. You're not going to get anywhere writing a paper about that. You'll be drummed right out of... so. Very fast, I realized how many years you spent doing really boring stuff to get to the good stuff. And I said, you know, all my life I'd been a rebel and I had rebelled against restrictions in schools, teachers, people telling me, adults telling me you can't do this or you shouldn't do that. Or, And I realized that as a storyteller, I could be as free as a bird. Yeah. And no I could test at no restrictions. I could try every kind of thing that was a curiosity to me. I could acquire the expertise to do it and do it well because it's all in books. It's all in people's minds. It's all the, the method for educating yourself is at your fingertips, especially with the Internet, though that didn't exist back then. Right, and right. I realized every single curiosity I had could be fulfilled and I could bring it right back into the writing. That's amazing. So when when you were smitten with story as a young person uh, through pictures and poetry and, and, and narrative of different kinds, what, what, did, did your parents read to you a lot? Did it come from your family? Did it, is it just something you found through school while you were rebelling through, from that authority? Like what, what, what happened there? I was exposed to the arts because my mother didn't have child care for when she was volunteering for a theater troupe. So I watched the theater troupe practicing and making the backdrops and all the things that went into telling story that way. I was paddled nightly multiple times for getting out of bed to color <laughs> by the nightlight because I wouldn't go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> and they would usually collect me asleep over my crayons. Oh, by that's the night so late. funny. I, I kind of did the same thing. I got in trouble for burning up all of dad's batteries and the flashlights reading under the covers. Yes. I got in yes. trouble for going into the teen section of the library to take out books that were supposedly beyond my reading level. But I would be honest, if not for venturing into my brother's bedroom and swiping the teenage books and then going to the library and doing the same. I would have been an outdoors person and never been a reader because what they were teaching us to read was so dull. Mm. I wouldn't have had it. And I had told very, very early that I had to go to school to learn to read. I couldn't learn to read at home. So that curiosity was, so I snuck into my father's lap when he was reading treasure Island and um, the jungle book yeah. and to my brothers. 
To your brothers? To my brothers. Were they older? or They or... were older than me, and those stories were more interesting than the children's books that my mom would read aloud. So those books, Robinson Crusoe and all those, left a sure. much deeper impression, and this was before I could even read. Mm. And I wouldn't get to do that every night. It was in pieces. <laughs> so I guess imagination had to kind of fill in. So Right. So already you were working to fill in some blanks mm -hmm. there. And then my you... grandmother worked as a recruiter for a private school called Ogon School. And there was a camp that ran during the summer. And it was a very privileged camp. And at that camp, we got to go, me and my cousins, on scholarship. And so I got to be exposed to all kinds of things that I wouldn't have been exposed to, including poetry reading and poetry mm. competition poetry reading two nights a week. Where you read out loud. We were split into teams and about six of us would read solo and then eight of us would do a choral reading. And we were um, schooled a lot by my grandmother who, who had a love of poetry because she was married to a professor who wasn't my real grandfather. He was my step-grandfather. And um, they were friends with Robert Frost. My grandfather oh, wow. had a book signed by Robert Frost when he died. Wow. So she instilled that power of language and what poetry could do. And some of it was very boring. I will admit to squirming in the chair. <laughs> <laughs> you know, as a, as a 9, 10, 12, 13-year-old, you want to be outside running and smacking a ball around or Absolutely. riding a horse. But it obviously left an impression because oh, I still yeah. have poetry on my shelf. Oh, uh, and you have poetry. Your your prose, Jenny, is is it it's lyrical and beautiful and poetic. And I'm starting to see uh, some some inklings of where that come came from very 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 early on. One thing you said that really struck me is this rebellion you had. Um, did it start when you said they taught things that were boring? They taught stories that were boring. So you wanted to read and learn and teach yourself. That's very interesting to me because I see some of these themes and what I've read of your work so far, as far as uh, the powers that be uh, gatekeeping the fun stuff, uh, using it for, for means of control, uh, bureaucracy administration and those types of things, as opposed to just teaching the fun stuff. Why not give kids the Black Arrow to read, oh. which one of my schools did, instead of something that doesn't make any sense and a kid can't relate to? Mm -hmm. Cry the Beloved Country is not something that eighth graders can necessarily identify with. Mm -hmm. But the Black Arrow, yeah. Mm -hmm. So there was a huge rebellion. I hated English class. I detested written homework. It was an accident that I went to a, a school that I couldn't stand, but they split <laughs> out their programming and they, they did a 414 where January you concentrated on one course. Mm -hmm. And I focused on microbiology. I focused on sciences. I was wanting to wow. do that stuff instead of, and accidentally my English teacher did a one hour course or a one hour session on creative writing. And I had so much fun creating fiction that I switched my January class away from, I guess I was going to do art, to creative writing. And that was the moment where I said, oh, I'm going to write stories. And I started writing novels and I did four of them. Boom, 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 boom. At and they're age? garbage and they're still in the file box. And <laughs> I will send them with my papers <laughs> to the collection that's going to receive my papers. But frankly, I will burn them before I would see them published. But they'll be oh. available to scholars because it will show you that the beginnings were very crude, very rough, and absolutely unreadable, practically. And how old were you at that point? I would have been a um, senior in high school. So 18, 19, you, four novels you cranked out. Yeah. Wow. And then upon graduation from high school... That's when the seed idea for the Wars of Light and Shadow began, 1972. That and I said, early. I don't have the life experience to write this. I don't have the literary depth to write this yet. And so I set off to travel the world. And I went to Russia. I went to Africa. I went to Europe. So I traveled on a shoestring and a dime. And then I also set out to get experience that I knew I would need to write this. I sailed offshore. and I 
gathered all the skills I would need to crew on small sail vessels off for a scene that did not occur until Destiny's Conflict. Which is book? Uh, 10. Wow. Oh my God. So you, okay. Senior year, you have the epiphany. You're smitten with story when you switch over to creative writing. And from there, you basically live your life filling the well of what you would need to tell this magnum opus that is coming to an end later this month. And acquiring the experience to write the first five or seven novels that I did, three of them with Ray Feist, but four on my own. Right. Before I ever sold the first book, and I did not sell the first book for The War of Light and Shadows until it was a completed manuscript. Wow. Because the vision was crystal clear, and I didn't want to have to contend with the push and the shove of trying to see that vision to fruition until it was at least book one was completed. And I had draft at that point up through Farrell's gate um, and beyond. I had tight notes. So I knew exactly where I was going and I had maturity as a writer behind me to be able to handle this massive project. So you had it, it did it all come to you at once? Like all the entire movement of this 11 book story or did a, a germ of an idea come to you and grow? I had a tight, Single space typed on a manual typewriter, a manual typewriter. <laughs> yeah, outline. I remember. <laughs> and if you look at that outline bullet point by bullet point, I stayed very true to that vision. The difference is that over the years of perfecting my skills, I acquired a depth of life experience that shifted. So it started out a very s s shallow idea of, you know, let's have light against darkness and let's turn it upside down and have the, the small dark haired guy be the good guy and flip the trope on its ear and just write this huge epic fantasy and have a big battle just like everybody else. Well, in other videos, I've described how researching for that epic battle upended my concept of what war and what we had been falsely led down a false trail mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and the glorification of how we think we solve conflicts and how we actually don't solve any conflicts at all. So the, the idea acquired depth. Mm -hmm. as it grew and snowballed and fleshed out from there. But yeah, I started out, I wrote five, um, I wrote thousands of years of back history to oh, frame really? the story. Yes, really? that, that all came before I even sat down to write the first page. And, and, and that's not seen the light of day. That was just for you, your backstory, your, your. Um, bits of it is seen the light of day, but not most of it's the iceberg under the water. Yeah. But I will draw off it. I have files and files and files of information um, that I will draw off of now that the main part of this epic story is complete. You know, wow. I can play with what's in the peripheral. Sure. And it sounds like life experience came in. It was important there because it sounds like, and I haven't, there's a buddy read starting in January, 2025. I'm going all in on this war of light and shadows. Uh, I've, I'm, I've, I've got serious FOMO of hearing how amazing it is. And I cannot wait. Um, but I have, but it sounds like there's an enormous amount of deeper philosophy to what is maybe surface of what we think about a war of light and shadows. There's a deeper philosophy. So the life experience was important to obtain that, I'm assuming, right? Yes. And other experiences like, I, aren't you, didn't you do transcendental meditation? A bit. Well, you'll see some things. Yeah. Yeah. You'll see some things. <laughs> um, you'll see some things. There are depths to this. There are many things that I poured into it because of my frustration with the way of the world. Mm. And can't we do an alternate? Can't, can't we do we... an alternate view? Can't we have an alternate evolution? Can't we have an alternate vision? And so I played with a lot of that mm. as this thing built and grew. Wow, I, I would um, love to see an alternate. And there's encapsulated pieces of it in, in Hell's Chasm, which was really a frustration piece. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, well, I, can't wait. I was I can't... exhausted from writing Peril's Gate. I was completely emotionally wrung out, which you'll see because that's the tipping point of the series. And that's where some of the majorly deep themes that not every person will recognize start to emerge. Okay. And okay. there were many people complaining about, oh, every epic fantasy go and reach, reaches book four and starts to sprawl. Mm -hmm. And... Wurtz doesn't have any more control of hers than anybody else. And I started getting mad. They said, you'll never stick the landing. You'll never. And they didn't realize that I had everything plotted out and worked on 
So that would not happen. Mm. So I pleaded with my publisher to write a standalone as an emotional release. And this was around book what in War of Light and Shadow? Seven, Seven. Peril's Gate. Okay. Peril's Gate. Um, So I could recover my emotional footing to go on with this big series. And so I could fling a standalone in the face of the naysayers plot that's five and a half days long that has everything a a major epic would have and finishes with a Mm -hmm. bang. And sticks Um, the landing. So yeah, it's a a fantasy 24 that takes five and a half days, but it has everything but the kitchen sink in it, multiple characters. It has everything you would look for in a major series, but compacted into one volume. It was also designed to restart my career because at that time, HarperCollins and Avon had merged and all the HarperCollins authors were cast loose. Mm. They cut the list, massively cut the list. And so I had to wait five years for everything to revert that I could resell another deal to get the, the U.S. brought back. So there would be a, a publication opportunity that would reach the U.S. at all. So I did small press with Misha Merlin to hold the place <sighs> in hardback and Hell's mm-hmm. Chasm was supposed to sell and create another U.S. publisher. Well, that didn't happen because the finish of Hell's Chasm spanned 9-11 and all of publishing died for two years. Everything froze. Even the sales in Britain froze for that two years. So it sort of fell under this shadow. Um. So... It's reviving now, thanks to you guys discovering it. It's an amazing work, and I find it so interesting that it, you did it as, an, as a cathartic re- emotional release, uh, you know, being built up from from hearing what's going on with the with the larger work you're doing. And it, how what did that do to you emotionally when you were doing it as an emotional release, and it got buried like that? Uh, it was hard. It yeah. was really hard because it timed with menopause, which is oh. an emotionally rough period anyway. Oh, yeah, I feel that's thought not I the would, best There time. were days I thought I would never crawl out from under, and it, ta- it timed also with my British agent. He had um, very tragically diabetes, and he lost a, a foot. Oh, God. Uh, amputated during that two years, and because of his health issues and the pressures on him, he forgot to submit the book. And I thought my British publisher had stepped off and written me off. And I discovered two years later, after two years of agony, that (laughs) it had never been submitted. And the British publisher was led to believe I had stopped writing. Oh, my good gosh. In the meantime, in the background, I was in a fury of, I will not quit and I will not give up. And there will be finished books piled on my agent's desk. And if I die with them unfinished, they will be there completed, waiting for their moment. Because, you know, Evangeline Walton went through that. Mm -hmm. She's a very well-known writer that Betty Ballantyne resurrected because she did a book called The Virgin and the Swine in 1933. She had an idea for a Theseus. And it never went because Mary Renault sold her Theseus. Mm. So she was shadowed out by that. So it never sold... She wrote more books, and they were yellowed manuscripts in a drawer. And when Betty Ballantyne did the Ballantyne Fantasy Series, she discovered these unpublished Evangeline Walton manuscript. And when Evangeline Walton was 80 years old, those books saw print. Tears were pouring down my face when she got acknowledgement for those books. She won a World Fantasy acknowledgement for that. But yeah, it just... So, you know, I learned a very hard grinding lesson that the only person who can stop you or make you fail is yourself. So no matter what life throws at you, you just have to keep going because if you don't, you will lose the lifetime you had to to express that creativity and that can never be recovered. That is the true loss. The time is gone. And not only a loss to the artist, but the audience. Right. That's right. I mean, That's... I'm hearing this thinking we're just enormously lucky as an audience that I'm starting to hear that thread from a very young Janny Wartz that would dig her heels in and rebel against authority. And now it, that's all the fuel you needed at this point to dig your heels in and go. And rebel against consensus opinion. Stack up, rebel let them stack against up. the algorithm, rebel yeah. against the 
failure of the low advance, rebel against the bookstore death spiral, all the things that stack against an author today. The entertainment industry is extremely cruel. Yes, but art is outside of time, right? It, it is. Will, it, yes. yes, and, and oh, the artist is the one that says, I pass or I fail. The artist is the one that says, I give in. The artist is the one that says, I can reinvent myself and keep going. The artist is the one that can say, I'm going to finish this series if it's the last thing I ever do. Yeah. Because it was designed to be a major work. I could not recover the half a lifetime it took to develop it. And I wasn't going to piss away the half a lifetime it was going to take to finish it. Yeah. So here Bravo. we are today. Here comes. Here comes Song Book of 11. the Mysteries. Yeah. Wow. Um, finished book. It is It is a reality. <laughs> oh, yes. It's yes. here. Yes. You know what I think? The first thing when I see that coverage, Annie, and I see what's behind you, and I want I don't want to get too much further in before I bring this up. You, again, you're a extremely accomplished painter-illustrator. This is a second medium you work in. You did the cover, I think, all the covers for this series, correct? Except for one British cover that I was literally buried under too, many, too much work to do. Don did it. Oh, Don did it for he you. He did the um the original cover for the British edition of Fugitive Prince because they had decided to split the book into two and mm. I suddenly had to do another set of covers US and British for the new book. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for Ships of Marior and Warhost was split in two, so I had to back step and do fill in those covers and at the same time I had resold Cycle of Fire trilogy and I had to redo all the covers for those. Oh wow. And at the same time, I had to do Daughter of the Empire. <laughs> oh so I was God. just completely... Your dance card was full. Yeah. And so I... I said, I just can't fit the British cover. And so Don luckily stepped forward and did that one and picked it up. So Well, you you, you definitely kept it in the family there. Yes. Um, Are you definitely. now... Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. As far as an artist and an illustrator, you're self-taught there as well? Like, how did this happen? When did this come about? Fill in the blanks for me on it's this. It's really like, simple. I grew up in Andrew Wyeth and Howard Pyle country mm -hmm. and the Brandywine River Museum and the Delaware Art Museum had all those magnificent yes. paintings for Treasure Island, for Marooned, for the Black Arrow, for the White Company, all those incredible books that I'd grown up listening to my dad read to my brothers. Those and adventures I walked in you shared. and yeah. I saw those paintings. They're big. Yeah, yeah. Mind-blowing. And uh, Maxfield Parrish was a Philadelphia artist. So mm -hmm. when he died, there was a major exhibit of his work in the Philadelphia Art Museum, murals and books. And so nobody ever told me you can't write and draw because these guys did it before me. Right. So when it came down to you can't write and draw, that was a rebellion too, because at that time, Conan was huge. Mm -hmm. Frank. Frazetta the genius was on every fantasy book cover and I will yeah. never denigrate his genius. It's absolutely brilliant artwork, but frankly, yeah. muscle bound heroes and tits and ass were not going to work for light and shadows. Yeah. We're yeah. talking a hero. That's a tiny little guy. He's five, four, five, six. He's a little guy. He's right. not a muscle bound. So I said, no way do I want this series to come out with a Frank Frazetta cover. Sorry, he's a genius. It would have sold a million books, but it doesn't suit the story. Mm. And the women in that book were not running around in bangles and, and breech clouts half clothed. <laughs> so I said, I'm going to have to teach myself to draw well enough to illustrate these books. And I had played with drawing stuff, but if you saw my early drawing skills, they were not up to the task. Mm. No way. So I set out to do it, and practice makes perfect. Yeah. So this was a journey, again, that, that is in service to this massive story you had in your mind. Pretty much, yep. But you see, I had the luck or the, the smarts to go to conventions. Mm -hmm. And at that time, who was hanging at conventions? Don Mates, Michael Whalen, Carl Lundgren. All of the greats that kicked off the golden age of science fiction painting and fantasy mm -hmm. painting. Star right. Wars was coming up. Indiana Jones was coming up. I could go to those conventions and hang my crap early attempts. And I mean, they were crap. 
They were crap. Yeah. Right yeah. next to a Michael Whalen, right next mm-hmm. to a Carl Lundgren, right next to the uh, Alan Lee and all these famous illustrators and go, babe, you got a long way to go. Home we go and draw some more. Were they so, open and generous to you? Were they helpful to you? Mostly, um, yes, they were. They could be incredibly honest. <laughs> Go back to the drawing board. Sure, or this sure. Is, you know, some of them were unvarnished. This is a piece of crap. Mm-hmm. Some of them said, go to the museums and look at the great greats that we looked mm. at. Right. I went to night drawing figure courses because my college didn't have enough of that. Mm -hmm. Um, I went to an experimental college that let you basically craft your education, but the level of drawing skills was not in that art department. So I took a half semester off from my college to go to an art school and man, was I far behind. I was in with third, third year art students and they could draw rings around me. So it just kicked my butt and made me stretch and push and stretch and push until I began to hang, and, and suddenly the work didn't look so far behind these guys. Then I started dragging a portfolio around New York, and it still took a couple of years right. to get my first job. Right. Wow. Because you're going up against the guys who do this every day. So you're splitting sure. your time 50-50 writing. Doesn't matter. You're going against the guys who are specialists. And right. to get a jo- cover job, you're kicking another guy off the job. Mm-hmm. Or you're stepping in because the guy they want – doesn't have time. Exactly. Exactly. And it, one thing I've heard you say, you they the guys can't you can, they'll tell you the guys can't write and draw. Or was it more difficult and I'm and I know the answer to this already, but I want you to touch on it a little bit. When you're out there dragging your portfolio around, uh, going on these journeys in service to this massive story you have in your head. Tell me about some of the obstacles, hurdles you have to pass over just from not being one of the guys. Oh, there are a lot of them. First (laughs) problem that you had was the number of sheer hours you had to put into developing the skills. Yeah. You could not do this with a full-time corporate job. Yeah. And really quickly, I realized if I step off and get that easy pay and the corporate job, I'm never going to be free of it. Yeah. It's yeah. not going to happen. And that's so, time lost, right? Forever. Forever, because you'd never break three of it. You would never yeah. kick it. Um, so I went without health insurance. I went with a an apartment in a carriage house where the toilet froze, and it was boiling hot in the summer, but the rent was cheap. And mm-hmm. it happened to be on the property of an author who could give me the example of what the business looked like. Yeah, Daniel P. Mannix wow. was a writer. He kept wild animals. He wrote for men's magazines. So I had a professional writer right there, and I rented yeah. his carriage house for cheap rent and froze my butt in the winter and boiled <laughs> in the summer. But it enabled me to freelance. Now, I could not freelance as a illustrator right away. I had to do uh, paste up for type back when mm-hmm. paste up was a thing. I had to do brochures for businesses. Mm. But I could earn a pretty good freelance wage. I went without health insurance. I went without fancy food. There were some weeks where I was eating eggs from his barnyard and graham crackers <laughs> and cucumbers from his garden. Okay. <laughs> I because, should compare, I should compare my, what I ate when yeah. I lived in LA. <laughs> it's yep, very yep. similar. <laughs> well, if you really want to do this, then you make the sacrifices to yeah. do it. I was getting up at 5 AM to clean stalls at, at boarding stables. Mm-hmm. For the extra pay, yeah. Um, and then I slipped into um, exercise riding to scratch my riding itch. And I know that you know horses, so you love to ride. Mm-hmm. You know what? You'll do anything to stay you on do the horse. Anything. Sure, sure. So yeah, I couldn't afford a horse, so I rode other people's and showed them. But I gained a whole lot of experience. Um, I couldn't afford riding lessons from the best, so I went as working student. Mm-hmm. Um, top-notch Olympic people were the ones who taught me. Wow. But I got it by exercise riding other people's horses under their instructor Mm -hmm. or learning from the people who were learning from them or saving up pennies and pennies and pennies and then going to like one lesson from the very best guy. 
yeah. and making that last for months. Yeah. So, you know, all kinds of ways you can cut corners to get the experience that you need and live on a dime. Yeah. So that's exactly what I did. And, you know, I didn't, I couldn't afford to live in New York. So I got on the train and went to New York and came back in one day or I camped on somebody's carpet, other artists, you know, can I crash on the floor at Rowena's house, please? You know? <laughs> yeah. Been there. Been, been there. there. Yeah. So you do what you have to do. And there are other people who are, who are working their way up along with you and, and you're working right alongside them trying to break in. I remember mm -hmm. going to a convention where there were five of us with major deadlines and we were given a suite by the convention. It was like artists were given this gorgeous suite by the convention right. so to get it's the like artists to go to their con and bring all these beautiful paintings. Well, we all had deadlines. So we threw everything off the marble tabletop and we're using the marble tabletop for a palette. All right. And five of us are painting cover paintings into the night at this convention with our paint all over and scraping it off with a razor so that, you know, yeah, clean up yeah. the next morning when you see it. <laughs> And you know the amazing thing but to be, to be painting like, elbow to elbow with the with other those professionals, those people, those people, sure. And it's like that's why I always ask that first question of when it hit you to tell stories, because you know, thinking back on my journey, what I did, and so many of these things are so similar. You have, you know, that you have to know that everyone goes through it, right? It's a calling. But thinking back on it now, like, wasn't it the best of times? Like, wouldn't, I mean, some of the it best was best and the worst of times. Best and the worst of. But time. you build a community. Even when you're next to a guy that's telling you that your drawing is crap, yeah, you're still going to be pushed to step beyond your limits again and again and again until you realize those limits are completely elastic. Yes. There is nothing that can stop you except the unwillingness to practice, the unwillingness that... to dream, the unwillingness to set that goal, and then take the murderous steps it takes to get there. And sometimes right. it is pure murder. And it, it is pure murder. And that's when I say uh, art is outside of time. You cannot consider how much of your life you have to give up to be good at you it. You can't. I didn't get married till 38. Mm. I had no social life or very little. Because the people that wanted to go do something wanted to do something so empty-headed. I said, forget it. So, you know, it can be a very lonely road, but a very rewarding one because eventually yes. you'll get it all. You just yeah. got to pace yourself and realize what is my priority today? Yeah. And what will it cost me to shift that priority? What will I give up if I'd rather stay home and paint or I'd rather get ready for a horse show tomorrow rather than mm -hmm. go out with this dumb dodo and, and, or a punch and drink, a right? Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, I don't want to be merciless, but I really had to parcel what's important to me this moment. And I ended up with a fairy tale marriage because I was willing to wait for it. Mm. Wonderful. Wonderful. I got to bring up, I was such a Rift War fan back in the day. I remember, remember when there was bookstores and malls. I remember my mom taking me to the mall, running to the bookstore when the new ones came out. And I just did a reread of the Empire Trilogy, the second trilogy last year after joining BookTube. And I was not, I did not remember how impressive that trilogy is. I've got to talk to you a little bit about that trilogy because it, to me, it was just lightning in a bottle. And I, I want to know how I, was it always, did Raymond always have the idea of he wanted to have a trilogy that checked in on this woman's life at three different stages and he needed you to do that? Where where did this partnership come from? It was a little messier than that. Okay. In that he wrote Magician and in his telling of it, and I hope I get this right, in order to make the Serrani not take over the aisles in just a couple of weeks, mm -hmm. he had to invent this convoluted, political system that you had to be in their culture to understand why this didn't happen because they obviously had the superior might. Sure. So he painted himself into a bit of a corner. So then he had the idea that he wanted to tell a story from the empire side and he wanted to have a woman rise through this male-dominated culture 
Mm -hmm. So his idea that he began with, the proposal idea was it will take place on Saranuani and it will begin with Mara being told her father and brother are dead and she's being pulled out of what amounts to a nunnery and a lifetime vow that isn't quite sealed yet. Right. And it will end with her getting the highest honor that society can bestow. So, so that's it, what he had. That's what he had. Okay. And no middle. And he, Don Mates had illustrated magician. And through Don Mates, Don introduced Ray to my very first novel, which was Sorcerer's Legacy that had a female lead. And mm -hmm. it's a political intrigue. Mm -hmm. And Ray read it. And Ray fixated on the idea that he wanted to collaborate because he says he couldn't write a teenage girl. Mm -hmm. And I was very dismissive of that because I said, Ray, write it and get over you. yourself. Yeah. And then I'll, <laughs> I'll read it. And if you get it wrong, I'll kick your butt and tell you. Mm -hmm. So this went on for two years. Wow. Two years. Yeah. Because I wanted to write Or of Light and Shadows. And I had four novels at that time and I had stuff under contract. And it's like, I didn't want to go do this other thing in this other world. And, you know, I didn't want to do it. Mm -hmm. I'll be blunt. I didn't want to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Until finally, the story got me. Yeah. The Machiavellian yes. thinking that would have to go into developing the culture and developing the political intrigue. And so finally, when I caved in, Ray and I sat down and we developed that outline like a lightning in a bottle. It literally, mm -hmm. what became daughter and servant happened in about four hours. Mm, you're kidding me. And then I was severely taken to task by certain people in the industry telling me it would ruin my career. Oh yeah. To collaborate? And I do this. To share? There were reasons that they had and it, it sounded logical from their perspective and I was all torn up and I, because by then I was in love with the story and I went to my then agent who was Virginia Kid. She was pretty well known in the field and she said, Janny, do you want to write the story? And I said, yes. She mm -hmm. said, write the story. Bravo. She was absolutely right. But yeah. I was confused enough and early enough in my career to be confused. And I got the sure. right advice and took it. So Ray and I did did the series. And by the time we got daughter going, we realized it wasn't going to fit in one book. So Daughter mm. and Servant was the original outline. Mm -hmm. And what happened there was Ray. Ray's Darkness at the Zathanon made the Times list. And so all of a sudden, Servant became a hot property because it wasn't sold yet. And we realized there would be a third stage to this tale because Mara could not become what she Needed did to. without yeah. stirring up certain factions. I'm not going to spoil the story. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. That would absolutely. become her enemies. Absolutely. So that's how Mistress came about. Mm. And so we had a nice fat auction. So where Ray actually cut his advance in half. And then and half again to pay my share to write wow. daughter. He took a huge hit. Mm -hmm. It paid off because we sold the second two books for a very healthy amount. And nice. here we are today. Yeah. Um, so it became me... somewhat of a classic because at that time, the setting and the, the female lead were not particularly done. And then I got... The reverse happened when I started Light and Shadows and people go, oh, you start out with such a male-oriented cast. And I'm going... I just wrote a book with Ray with yeah. his female lead. Get off it. You know, I can write anything. <laughs> yeah, you can do both. And if you think that you're going to look at this series through prejudice eyes, it's going to kick your butt as yep. you read the series well. Okay. Because, well, yeah. I can already tell that from it will kick your butt. Mel's Chasm. I can already see that from Mel's Chasm. It will kick your butt. Yeah. I, I just think the collaboration, and I know, look, I'm very interested in the collaboration because... Uh, I'm in the middle of one now, and and writing is such a, a, a singular solo type of thing generally, and it's hard to work a collaboration. And you guys somehow, it's the best of both of you. This Mara is uh, it is a classic. It is an absolute classic. It will all, it will always be on my favorite list. I cried at the end of each of these three books, and not because you know different type of emotions hitting you different way, but the transcendent of the human spirit in this female in a patriarch's world that is 
answering the call of destiny to change her reality, just like young Janny digging in her heels, not accepting what this world is, but accepting what it can be. And in different spaces of her life, whether it be young girl, whether it be someone looking for partnership and love, whether it be someone at the on the she did it to side save of her life. family. She did it all for, and it's like I'm telling you, there aren't. There is such an amazing amalgam between the two of you. It just knocks me out. It was a match made in heaven in many ways because Ray's strength and mind blended very well. But yeah. also there, as in any collaboration, there's going to be moments when you knock heads. And uh, here's yes. my advice to anyone where that happens. Okay, I want to hear this. That's when you get off your high horse and you <laughs> kick over your imagination and you find another way. <laughs> when neither one of you will give ground, I want it this way and you want it that way, find that third way. Because it's going to be better than both of them. That, but you know, artists are, you know, that ego that comes in, it's, that's not the easiest thing to do to let go. It isn't. But if you can't let go, don't collaborate. Yeah. And mm. and in this case, Ray had the franchise of that universe. So the upshot was I had to give, but I'm sneaky about it because I wasn't going to give <laughs> unless we came up with a third way that was better. <laughs> You wouldn't give unless you got a little something. And him too. I mean, and so yeah. that's, in many cases, that's why some of the magic happened was because there was always that third way. Well, I just have to tell you, I read it as a young man. I was such a fan of of the Rift War. And I remember seri the second trilogy because it's like, oh, cool, we get to see the other side of the Rift. Uh, but I do not think I could fully appreciate it until I reread it last year and I was at a different stage of my life. You know, it the way was good designed art to does. be timeless. Yeah. Timeless. It and as all of my books are. Yeah. That's something I build into everything that I do. Yeah. They should hold up no matter what stage of life you're in it. So there won't be a suck fairy. You can go back <laughs> to my first book and there won't be a suck fairy because I was writing from a more mature point of view, my first published work was at 29 and I had done some living. Mm -hmm. I had done some traveling. I had broken my perspective out of my little upbringing or my little privileged space. And I had seen some of the things in the world that caused me to reset what I thought I knew about myself. Mm -hmm. And so that blends into the story. And the only reason, honestly, that you saw the empire first was the advance was bigger <laughs> and often the marketing follows the advance. And in some ways, what I was striking to do at the time, particularly in War of Light and Shadows, was not quite along the traditional vein. Mm -hmm. And it's taking until now for that to be recognized because the readership that the series requires needs to have a little bit more life experience under their belt. It's not going to work necessarily for a 13-year-old person mm -hmm. or a 15-year-old person. Sometimes it does because some of those readers are more aware. Mm -hmm. Or ready. Yeah. But honestly, it wasn't written for to be a YA. Yeah. It wasn't written to be the traditional classic fantasy, even though it starts wearing the trappings of that. Those balloons are going to get popped and popped hard. And so people who are expecting that might hit a wall because they're trying to skim and they think they know. And the story and is they, actually yeah. following a different perspective than they. So it takes a little more focus to realize that once you do. You're, you're all in. You're yeah. all in. And all Hell's in. Chasm does the same thing. You yes. said to yourself how many times it morphed out of what you expected it to be. Yes. And I'm going to get to, I have, look, I have a Patreon and this is a question I have from a Patreon, and I'm going to try and squeeze it in here while we're on Empire, right before I move on. Since the Game of Councils was first, and it is, if George ever cannot finish Game of Thrones, Janny, would you step in and finish this for him? Because the Game of Councils is every bit as involved and amazing as the Game of Thrones. I gave George a quote 
for his first <laughs> fantasy novel, which was a Game of Thrones. And I read a manuscript stack that was this high over Christmas week and deferred my finish of Fugitive Prince mm. to read that book. So, George? <laughs> oh, we're leaving it at that. <laughs> oh, okay. I want to move I on. I don't to have enough time left to deal with that mess. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope George does. I, I loved George Martin's writing, and I enjoy, and I absolutely stand behind the quotation I gave to launch that series. Yeah. So, George, just, you know, whatever. Oh. You know, happens I, look, to it. It has merit, but I'm not the one that's necessarily there. I've got only so much time, and I already spent some of it collaborating, <laughs> doing this wonderful <laughs> story with Ray. I have more ideas I want to do. Oh, that's so wonderful to hear. I want to move on to Hell's Chasm because I'm so excited because I just read this, and you know, the, the, here's my very first thing that I'm going to throw out there, Janny Wirtz, and you tell me what you think about this. Where the heck is Michael B. Jordan? He should have bought the film rights to this. It should be huge. If people are looking for the next Game of Thrones, this could be such an amazing major motion picture. And the character of Mikhail is so multi-layered and amazing for a man of color. If he, I know he has a production company, he should be on the phone right now. He doesn't know it exists. <laughs> well, how do we fix that? Uh, get a whole lot of readers to read it because gonna... there aren't enough copies printed to even make <sighs> a dent in the popularity it would have to have to come to the attention of those people unless you have a stroke of blue lightning, which happened with The Princess Bride, where the guy stumbled across a copy, yeah. fell in love with it, and made the film. Yeah. So it's a big universe out there. I don't know where these copies are tumbling. I thought James Cameron could do a hell of a job with this one, too. Ooh. Because so... he can do the women. Yes. Yes. Um, you know, can he could do Bertara, and he could do... But the books have to be seen, and it fell into that hole. And so, you know, if I told you how many copies were printed compared to the ones that have reached the level of awareness public awareness that's outside the bubble of youtube or outside the bubble of my books have a long way to go we're gonna we're gonna get them there Janie. Um, and you mentioned so it a just little needs bit. readers it just needs eyes on the page needs word of mouth because right. the proof is in the pudding it's in the it's in the books let's talk it up you started bringing up the shifting narrative there's 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 look it is this is a magic show just when you think you have the cat by the tail of the story, just when you think you have your claws sunk in, it becomes something entirely different. And not only the narrative, the story itself, character to character. Well, you talk about an arc, someone changing from the beginning to the end. Wow. Did you, and I, I'm really interested in this answer to this question, because you say how you had everything planned out for War of Light and Shadow. Did you leave room in this for the characters to surprise you where they went, or did you have this outlined out to the nth degree? I didn't. I didn't, and I did. Um, there's a book out called The Treasury Synopsis, and it was done by Chris Haviland, and you can mm -hmm. get it in an ebook, and it actually shows actual outlines of books that were presented to publishers and sold. Mm. And the outline, the original outline for Hell's Chasm, was in there. Really? Uh huh. What I actually sold the book because I sold it as a completely unwritten outline at the time. And my editor was Jane Johnson, and she was hugely behind the concept of it. Mm -hmm. She really loved the concept. She was convinced it was going to do super well. So it she actually, um, but you know, timing, mm -hmm. timing is everything. So I'll tell you what began it. The first seed of the first idea, I tend to do this. I'll throw things that don't fit or are disparate ideas into one box and shake it until something pops out. I love the that. The first idea was um, the Tevis Cup, which is an endurance race that's run out west. You said you were familiar with it. It's yeah. a real race with horses yeah. where they do 100 miles in 24 hours over a yeah. mountain in very challenging desert terrain. And not yeah. all the horses are going to make it. They have vet no. checks along the way. So it's an extreme endurance race. And I said, what if a team of horses and their endurance was the thread upon which the fate of a kingdom 
relied. So it began with that idea. Then I tossed in a little bit of things that frustrate me about the world, which one of the themes is racism, makes me really angry, and I can't get people to see around the corner sometimes. I live in the South. Mm -hmm. I do search and rescue, and I hang out with people that sometimes I hear things. And I've worked with people, so a lot of my life experiences hit that frustration. And so I tossed a little bit of that in there, and I tossed the idea of class mm -hmm. and where there's a class disparity or a regional disparity where people don't hear each other. Mm -hmm. And actually, I didn't start out with race. I sat down to write the first chapter, and in walked McHale, and he was yeah. who he was. And yes. I said, oh, my gosh. It demanded attention. Demanded. demanded. It had yes. to be written that way. And yeah. I realized if I write it this way, um, there are going to be certain markets in, in the United States that will not take this book. And did so you that, not care? Did you not care? I, I did not care, but I also recognized that the publisher had invested money. So I wrote to Jane and I said, Jane, here's what's happened. Mm -hmm. I can't envision this story coming any other way. And God bless Jane Johnson for her courage. She said, write it. Wow knowing that that was going to be a strike. There mm -hmm. would be certain readerships who would not read it mm -hmm. um, from all walks of life because of, mm -hmm. I'm not yeah. an own voice. I'm not this. I'm not that. I have background, but that doesn't matter to some people. Color my skin plays too. So Absolutely. I wrote the story as it was meant to be written and said, damn the consequence. Yeah. And now you have it. And into it came... Some of my experience in alternate healing, which you might have oh, recognized. Mm -hmm. Some of my experience in alternate perceptions, which you might have recognized. Into it came some of my extreme wilderness experience. What would you do? Um, I have worked with a search and rescue team. I'm still on their mounted team. It appalls me to say that in Florida... The survival time for a lost person can be 24 hours, and then they're looking for a debtor. And I'm going, what happened to common sense? Yeah. What happened to people's ability to survive in an adverse, con to make decisions with critical thinking? Yeah. Would you die of, of thirst before saying, I'll take a chance, I'll be, I'll be found before the parasites take mm -hmm. over? Yes, you know, yes, yes. So certain critical thinking has been lost, and I gained mm. a lot of that experience offshore sailing or or wilderness. I did outward bound at 17 years old. Oh, wow. Um, and I paid for it myself mm. because I wanted to go. Yeah. So I said, how would you take an untried young girl and put her through an extreme experience? And what would she be when she came out the other side? So a lot yes. of things poured into the writing of this that just organically became part of the tapestry. Mm. And I've worked with hounds. I've ridden horses. I know the limits of both. Yeah. Mm. Um, I, I work with flanking I'm search and rescue dogs on scent. Still not right over some of that, Janie. You, 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 yeah, I, I'll, I'll tell you. I agree with everything you've said. And then there's one thing I will add that just struck me time and time and time again with each character in this book, including the non-human ones. This is an amazing story and book of sacrifice, self-sacrifice. It, it, it just, it, 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 how best to describe this? There's the evil, the insidiousness that's going on in this kingdom is able to hide and flourish by placing itself in the bureaucratic authority. It's by the single individual people that are willing to dig in their heels and have a code and sacrifice that there's a chance at, at hope. But not give up their individuality in the beginning. Oh, no, absolutely. And not. also not to judge by surface appearance, because if you look at the cast of characters in Hell's Chasm, every one of them plays a role. Mm -hmm. And if any one of them had failed, the whole house mm. of cards would have come down. So it wasn't only reliant on the hero. It was also reliant on the young girl that has to recognize her place 
in her nation. Well, and it had again, it all the courtiers that were involved, the ones that fell short and the ones that shored up the ones who fell short. And they weren't the characters you would have expected. Outward Bound taught me that. It taught me that you can take the most shrinking, cowardly person in the batch, never underestimate them because in one instance, they're going to be the one that's going to step forward and save the rest. And it they're goes, going to surprise you. Right. So you can't go by your surface impression. Sorry, first impressions are often wrong. Exactly. It's those ideals, uh, those ideas they have of the world, these, these courtiers. And again, I'm trying to, to work around where there's not spoilers. They have ideas of the way society should work and class systems should work and uh, and who, the, who and, and what foreigners should be listened right. to or not? But now, but now those get sacrificed when they are able to recognize how what's really going on. Those type of sacrifices that these things that might have been ingrained in them, they're able to let go of. And what a beautiful world if that could actually happen every now and again. Well, I told you a lot of what sparks me to write is my frustrations. Yeah. With the pettiness of the real world and what happens if a character can transcend that. And it isn't just going to be the hero. This isn't the typical, you know, the hero leads them all out of trouble. No, it's no, it's a collaborative effort. And everyone no. has a something small and but critical mm -hmm. that must be contributed. And so I try to look at people as what critical thing are you contributing that I might overlook because I'm careless or prejudiced or blind or arrogant? Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. we see all those characteristics in the characters break down under pressure. Yeah. Where they're forced to recognize or first to slam their mind shut. Yes. And refuse. Yes. So and it goes both ways. The challenge is, which way are you going to step forward? And as Philip Chase so beautifully put it, what's your legacy going to be today? Yes, yes, and that that young royal Anja, that that young princess you were talking about, the sacrifice she has to make at the end, realizing what her kingdom needs, um, was was beautiful. Not only the human, but some of the animal characters, the loyalty, the sacrifice they had to make. Warhorse, uh, did you yes. ever watch the movie Warhorse? It yes, broke I, me. Yes. Oh. It broke me. And how many times in history have the animals paid the price yes, paid for human price. conflict and and not and they're they're special they're they don't i even, wanted you to feel it the horses will give their all and the yes. dogs will i wanted you to feel that you and can kill your horse or kill your dog yeah. on something so simple as a one-day search mm -hmm. if you're not paying attention and how circumstance can force the sacrifice of the animals, and that goes so unrecognized. Yes, because the loyalty, and they won't give up. They won't give up. You know those those animals. Those they're, your dogs they're gonna give everything. will give you anything you ask everything. them for. Yeah, and they'll love you no matter how you abuse them. Yeah, but yeah. I wanted you to read this book, and I wanted you to feel it. No, oh, and and believe me, I'm still not quite right over some of it. There was a couple scenes that truly struck me, and I'm interested so much in it now, even more than you said you had to call the publisher and tell them, hey, this is happening and this is changing. There's some truly, really uh, racially charged scenes in this book. Um, and I'm thinking two uh, that, that happen, and I don't want to give them away too much, but uh, there's a moment where a man is made to uh, strip and lay on a cot because you know and it's like there's then there's a moment where uh there a whipping happens but there's so much going on there's so many layers to it and i just you know a lot of people would not even of course there's the humiliation of of the authority and being pushed and be just being used like that but then there's other layers here and it was going so deep into character where did you find because a lot of writers wouldn't have touched that. Where did you find the fortitude and the strength? Like, you know what? I'm I'm going all in on this. Well, I've always been a go all in kind of person. I either did a genius stroke or I went and blew both feet off with an Uzi. <laughs> 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 I wanted to show the difficult choice because Taskin is the commander of the Royal Guard. He lives yeah. in a very prejudiced society. He is a letter of the law kind of guy. 
He is yes. ethical. He is absolutely rigidly ironclad ethical. Now, what do you do to get your subordinate yo-yos in line who are yeah. not so ethical, yeah. who are not so open-minded, who are not able to step out of sight of their prejudice? So I wanted to really twist in the conflict that that commander was under to disarm the, the, the racial prejudice yes, the best yes. way he could so that he had unity at mm -hmm. any cost. At any cost. So I wanted you to see the decisions that he had to make, and they're not good ones. No. But the reasoning that he had and the reason that he made, he was actually on Mikhail's side. Yes. And the, and, but the and, letter and of the law and the, the security of the realm relied on him keeping his subordinates in the yoke and in line. And how was he going to do that? So he's faced with some brutal choices. And I wanted to show that as a fellow commander, but an underling, that Mikhail mm -hmm. understood that. Yeah. And, and here, a sacrifice of Mikhail to understand that and take it as part because of Because the bigger picture is... Yes. His, Mikhail his, can't yes. escape the straits that he's in. No. The people who are born into a racial society can never escape the constraint of that instant identification. They yes. can never shed that. And you know... I'm sorry, white fragility is a thing because oh, yeah. you watch the people right now getting exhausted, fighting against what they perceive as the world's injustices right now. And you know what? Those people that are caught on the wrong side of racism, they have to fight the same fight day by day by day, generation after generation after generation. And you know what? They don't lose heart and they don't flag and they don't quit. Even if they can't see the way out in their lifetime, mm -hmm. their courage and their persistence and their ability to contain their rage and still find joy in life where they can and still mm -hmm. fight against it and know when to push and when not to push, what battles can be won today and what can't, and then when to lay it all on the line and bleed for it. They have more humility and more long-sightedness and more courage and more perseverance because they have to. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to reflect that quality in Mikhail. Yeah. Is the bigger picture more or less important than his personal feelings? Yes. And also, character-wise, character -wise, what he's gone through in the past makes this so important he can't allow the past to repeat he's you know his own baggage that's pushing him towards this and and he's honor and duty bound to do this for the bigger good the the larger good of the of, because the poor decisions by his overlords yes caused him to fail read the dedication do you have your book mm -hmm. at hand read the dedication to to the story did you read that i I'm, i i did i don't have my glasses i'll i'll, I'll murder it if i i'll try, read it i'll try. find it there you I go gotta, get it get it get it jenny battered old copy but yeah this this dedication was written in the midst of right the heated feelings after 9 11 because mm -hmm. this book was this writing of it spanned this is the dedication to this book and it encapsulates for the lawyers may they keep their hearts open for those who make decisions and hold sway over others May they do the same, only more so. And for all who have given or lost their lives because one or the other fell short, this story. Yeah. It's a two-way street. The yeah. guy with the gun, the guy with the sword, the guy who's the warrior is entrusted with the integrity to carry out the right decision, whether... His overlords say so or not. Yeah, but it takes a very special certain guy. And that's why Mikhail's my guy. That's why, I mean, he, I'm, I'm telling you, Michael B. Jordan should be on the phone. 
Well, I don't know who Michael B. Jordan is. What movies did he do? <laughs> Get him on the phone. Send him a copy of the book. I don't know what to do except to keep going as I'm going because <laughs> I've got to just keep keep plowing the ground and keep writing and then just hope that serendipity and readers and, and the people find these books and the people that love them shout them out because – I can't do that as an author right now in, in the climate and the way this industry runs, the author can't be the one to do that. Right. I understand, but I just want, I want it for you. I'm going to do my, I'm going to, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to keep saying it until the universe hears me. Um, but look, I love that the ongoing trope in this that we've talked about and all the way back from the beginning where you rebelled is these individuals that'll draw a line and dig their heels in. And I see that in Mara. I see that in Mikhail. I see that in Aja. I see that in Taskin. I see that. I see that glimmer in all, in a lot of these characters um, that'll answer the call of destiny. And it's the ones you don't expect it to come from. It's the ones that you may look down on. It's the outsider. It's the one that are living in the low town that are just, you know, you don't even want them to be called up to take this investigation on. Uh, it's it's the woman in a, in a patriarch's, patriarchal world. I love that theme that I see over and over again so much in because these first I four really, books. Because I really, really sympathize with the children that get it beaten out of them. Are we going to see that in War of Light and Shadows? Oh, those, yeah. Do those the okay, those oh, themes yeah. continue. That's just but ongoing. But you'll see it from, from two sides of the coin. You'll see the one that doesn't give in and you'll see the one they're the people who, who go through adversity and are made stronger. And they're the people who cave to it. Mm -hmm. They're the people who can stand up to their weaknesses, recognize yes. them and change. And they're the people who retreat into their weaknesses. They're the people who have a strength and in the situation where that strength will become a weakness and, and create a disaster mm. who will not admit it. And they create the disaster. Right, right. So there's and a lot of that. Yeah. Self-recognition yeah. oh. is a gigantic theme that okay. I come back to, but also trying to give a, back a piece of my experience to the kids who are caught and it's beaten out of them. They're told they can't and then they believe it. Or they have a bad teacher, or they get a bad grade, they get a bad experience, or they're told by their whoever is mentoring that's wrong <laughs> not to reach outside the pack, not to strive for what they want to do, not to go against the grain of what they're told. And then they end up smothered for the rest of their life. Yeah. And where are the regrets? Yeah. We yeah. all lose when that happens. So yeah. I'm trying to give back some of that determination that has seen me through. And uh, yeah, and I see it in the work. And sometimes they're, they're, they're smothered by the very bounds of society that they need to answer to, but it, they won't let them come all the way to fruition as individuals. And it's, uh, it's, we lose them as individuals and we lose yeah. them spiritually. We lose them as a functioning human being mm -hmm. and we lose the incredible contribution that their specific individuality could give back to the world. And whether it's poverty takes it away or whether it's, bending to the norm mm -hmm. which doesn't exist or the expectations of society Whatever. that you will start to however find comfort in however it gets in. lost right however it gets you, squashed yeah. mm -hmm. um whether it's prejudice whether it's gender whether it's no matter what it's lost to i mourn that we lose that and the potential that we could have as a collective human race if that potential was not destroyed by war there, or by adversity or by whatever reason. There needs to be more mentors like you, Janny, that dig their heels in and never give up as ex a, a mentor by example. Well, and you don't get that without being shattered and putting yourself back together again. Yeah. It doesn't come for nothing. It could, if you meet the right mentor young mm -hmm. or you get the right, or, or even often... It, you could meet the right mentor if you kept your ears open to the fact they existed. Sure. But you're taught not to listen. Mm. So I think in many cases when I was shattered, I would find or hear the right voice because I never quite gave up listening for it. I always had this piece of me that said there's got to be something better. 
Mm. I'm telling you, every time I hear you speak, Janie, I feel like I understand the world a little bit better. <laughs> Before it's I move a, it's on... It's an unlimited world, and we're yeah. taught to look at it as outer circumstances limit us. Our inner circumstances do not limit us. And in this book, what does the hero say? How often, it's Jusoud says it, how often does our imagine, lack of imagination mm -hmm. create our defeat? Your imagination is bigger than any circumstance in this entire world. So if you can't see the way out, imagine it. And if yeah. you can't imagine it, admit that you're too small to imagine it and say, it exists somewhere right. and wait for that somewhere to pop up. But if you're right. not looking, if you say that somewhere doesn't exist, then I, you stop I know listening. that I, I corresponded with you and I said, I wrote myself into a corner and I do this often on purpose. Yeah. There's a certain scene in Hell's Chasm where I created an insoluble problem for these you characters and I did not know how they were going to fix it. <laughs> yeah. I didn't either. <laughs> and there was one obvious way and I crossed that off the list right off the bat. Yeah. And I lay awake night after night after night going, I'm going to run these guys up against this insoluble problem. And I don't know how I'm going to write up my way around it. I don't know how. Up until the day before that scene was written, I did not know how it was going to solve. But the fact that I refused to believe there wasn't a solution forced my brain, my subconscious to pop another route. And, and this listen. is what people do over and over in their lives. They say, I can't do this because, and they list all the reasons not. Mm -hmm. And they don't leave any room for lying awake at night for six months to let your brain <laughs> figure out a way around the problem. Yes. Oh, I've been there so many times. I've been there so but many times. But we're not taught to do this. I, I, I can't get that moment to work. I can't figure out this character motivation. I can't, I can't, I can't. And it's like you just, you it's like a scab you won't stop picking at. I refuse to. I'm Pick at it and up. walk away. Pick at I'm, it and walk I'm, away until finally. But we're not taught to problem solve, and that's how it's done. Yeah. Not settling for nothing. Yeah. Not Instead, accepting. we're taught all the doors are closed, therefore they stay closed. Well, I'm fascinated by what you said because it came to you, and you say people don't listen. And it's interesting sometimes you don't listen to yourself. You don't listen to what the universe, call it what you will, is going to give you if you just let yourself Your be open to it. Your mind can solve it. You just have to leave it free to do that. Yeah. Your mind is a dog. You say, insoluble problem, go fetch. And you keep throwing <laughs> that ball, and you keep throwing that ball, and you keep losing that ball until mm -hmm. finally your subconscious and your human creativity of imagination will deliver. But that is admitting there's something bigger than what you can think of by logic. Intuition and intuitive problem solving is not logic. The logic will work in hindsight, but intuition leaves the gap mm -hmm. and then makes it work backwards. So we forget that feminine side of ourselves that says, I don't have to know. I'll know when I get there. Yeah. Instead, we hammer on it with logic. And you know what? There is no room to add pie onto a ruler. <laughs> okay? <laughs> and that's the patriarchal way, right? To hammer it with logic. Right. As exactly. opposed to just, you just, let me just stop. And I'm, look, I might, look, at my, I, I'll get Amy up here. She'll tell you I'm the worst at it. And I, you know, I, I, I'm still I'm still young enough to learn new tricks, and I, that's what I would love to learn and get better at. Well, the imaginary numbers are bigger than the regular numbers. Yeah, that logic can unwind a regular number, but it can't it can't grok pie. Forget it. So <laughs> if you realize your mind is like the imaginary number, mm -hmm. and you try to tackle it with logic, all you're going to do is strap it down and torture it to death. Yes. Yes. One more thing I do want to, I, and I don't know if there's a question in this or not. Maybe it's just, I just want everyone to read this book. Whatever type of book you like, the story shifts so many times, you get a little bit of everything. You get a mystery. You get court intrigue. You get a bit of romance. And not only this, but the characters, as I say, shift from so, from where they start to where they end up in these beautiful moments of sacrifice the tonal shifts of this book 
truly struck me. Now, did you set out to perf to personally do like to make sure I'm gonna I want I wanted to start a, a, a little bit like they call it cozy now. It kind of starts almost like a cozy fantasy, a little uh, little uh, a princess. Oh, uh, not quite. It's got a few edges. It's got it's got a few edges. I'm but sorry, at the very, you know, starting with a lame hero sharpening his sword. It's it, not it exactly it, cozy, it, and it's not exactly comforting here. Not comforting, but it starts. It starts like I knew what was coming at me. Let me. I'll say that I knew what was coming at me. I got a missing princess. I got an investigate. I mean, I think I I think I got an idea what's coming at. Then it starts. It becomes very. The magic system becomes extremely dark. The intrigue starts to build on itself and build on itself and build on itself. Um, the world starts to expand into a metaphysical reality beyond the physical reality. We start to have moments of of true horror spread through there. You know, as far as some of the villains and what they do in the magic system and how it works. Were these tonal shifts purposeful or that that's just where the story took you? Some of them were just where the story took me, and some of them were the characters themselves. You start with a rigid character like the Duchess of Fail, and she doesn't sacrifice, but she has an epiphany mm -hmm. where she has to recognize outside of her class barriers. So just throwing the whole mix on the table and throwing this massive threat into the middle where the people, I wanted a small country that was very homogeneous like Switzerland where the outsiders would really stick out and where they live this pretty isolated, bucolic and settled existence and yeah. this massive threat that they can't possibly handle. Right. And then they don't trust the very one person who might have the experience to deal. Yeah. And won't recognize. So I just let all the marbles run down the chute. <laughs> and, you know, there's a certain amount of trusting your intuition to deliver the comic character that walks on, you know, where the opera won't happen till the fat lady sings. Yeah, yeah. She was a piece of humor, but she had a signal role to play. Oh, when absolutely. When you look at what she does. So mm -hmm. letting their personalities come forward when necessity calls, what are they going to do? Are they going to shrink or are they going to stand up? And this letting their personality, letting their character personality take the role that that fits what's happening. Are they going to grow or are they going to shrink? Yeah. And all of my books have a bit of that or a lot of that. I mean, it's yeah. part of, it's part of experiencing other cultures in life is people surprise you. Yeah. I think that has a lot of that. I think, I, I mean, I haven't started Warlight and Shadows, but uh, I think they have a lot of that. I think you have something enormous to teach us. And I think that's why your books have a lot of that. Oh yeah. But they're fun too. It, uh, no, I mean, it I'm was telling a roller you, coaster ride too. It, that's so much it. It's so many. I'm telling you, whatever kind of book you love, it's in this one book. It can be your favorite, no matter what kind of favorite you have. It's 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 a it's an amazing piece of work. It really knocked me out. Well, I'm thrilled that it it did its job <laughs> because. I've read a lot of books and I read the library growing up and I read beyond my level. That's where I got the ability to use language the way I do. And the one thing that makes me infuriated more than any single thing, not sticking the ending or landing your, your reader with a cliffhanger. Yeah. Cheating. <laughs> yeah. And no, so that... I try to make a book. I won't have the cleverest first line. I may not have the most smashing opening of a book. I will build it. But I'm going to stick that ending. Uh, you, you, that corner you wrote yourself into, you, that was, I have to say, hats off. I would never have seen that coming. And then when it came, I was like, again, an enormous sacrifice. Swashbuckling adventure, just off the chart, swashbuckling adventure. Like, it, it just, it was, it was... It was everything I wanted, but I would have never seen it coming. I would have never have, have figured that that was around the corner. Well, that's what I strike to do. And that's why <laughs> I will paint myself into an impossible problem. And that's part of why the finale to Light and Shadows took so long to write. Because I knew the end point. I knew where I wanted to, to finish. But the getting there has yeah. to be unpredictable. And it has to fit. And it has to top 
everything that's come before. And it has to seamlessly mesh together and have no fat. Yeah. And so engineering that finale, engineering that entire 11 book series that should have it, been 10 because ships and warhost should have been one volume. Should have been one book. Um, so it's, it's, it's a, a life story work. in five arcs and um, it took an enormous amount of work behind the scenes and it wasn't necessarily logical work. It was pounding the desk and having that intuitive solution and letting the character surprise me. Yeah. This is what is amazing to me, Janie, just talking to you tonight. It's a life's work in that you lived your life to get there. The things you learned, you lived your life to get there. You and lived the your life. Yes. And the insoluble things. I knew where I wanted to take the finale of this book on day one. Yeah. And I knew I did not have the experience, not the spiritual experience, not the physical experience, not the first clue how to pull that off. I had to learn it as I went. So I created the challenges in life that were going to bring me to that finale. So by the time I got there, I would have that experience and have that knowledge. And it's led me to some pretty amazing things. What a journey. I mean, looking back, you lived your life in service to tell this amazing magnum opus, this great story. And I mean, looking back, I can't, I just can't imagine the journey you have had. How does it feel now to be at the finish line? Huge relief. Really? Because there's no trepidation at all. No, because I got, there's more to come. I've got other ideas. I, I'll be free actually to do something else. Even if I want to write a thriller or change my byline and get out from under some of the drag of <clears throat> women don't write epic fantasy. <laughs> you know <laughs> What? <laughs> so, you know, it's an enormous relief because all the naysayers, all the people say, what if you die before you finish it? <laughs> and here we are in the middle of a pandemic that actually causes brain damage. And I'm going, I'm going to have to live like a hermit because I, I need all of my functioning neurons sure. here to pull this together because I won't be able to pull all the pieces. So, you know, all of the things I had to do to get here and, and all of the aging parents and I lost my dad and I lost my oh. mom and, you know, all the life things that hit you. Sure. Um, Arriving at the end of this and also the delicate survival that had to happen because mergers happened. I've lost editors multiple mm. times, working with people that hadn't read page one, mm. trying to get backing for this series when there was no real incentive to back it. The numbers aren't adding up, okay? Mm-hmm, mm -hmm. And I'm going, the proof's in the pudding. I know where this is going to finish. The whole thing is going to be worth it, but there's no way I can pitch deck this. And the original buying editor, long, long gone, had told me, I don't want to know anything about what's coming. I want to read it as it happens. So I'm sitting here with this massive project with a publisher with their blinders on, yeah. not understanding what I'm even writing. I don't want to know. And then actually bucking the publicity that would have made the empire go, this is a bit of a different animal. There will be yeah. crossover readers, but what I was striking to do with Wars of Light and Shadows is not the same thing. Mm -hmm. Not at all. Mm -hmm. So trying to wrestle the, the, let's just throw it out there and rely on your past success with Ray to carry this. Yeah. And readers who are 15 years old going smack and hitting the wall because it wasn't yeah. really written for that. Sure. I feel like the, the booktube community has rescued this book and changed the narrative because they are getting what it's really about and they're placing it in the company of the other books, which will bring the correct readers in. And that is gaining momentum and is beginning to happen. And I can only hope it will continue. But I had to go on for decades with no assurance it would ever happen. No assurance it would ever come together. No assurance that the right readers, except a very small niche group, would mm. ever find this book because the press runs were too small. Yeah. Wouldn't and didn't even still have a chance. are too small. Yeah. Yeah. We've just wrestled audiobook for volume one. 
And the mm. number of people who say, I can't read epic fantasy because I'm an adult and I have a life and I don't have time unless there is audio. Mm -hmm. So effectively, the marketplace, certain facets of it were shut down. Yeah, yeah. They've, they've changed. They've moved. They've morphed. Couldn't yeah. change my byline because I'm in the middle. Sure. So when, when publishing went through these massive contorting changes, I was stuck on this track and I couldn't step off. So I'm extremely happy because when I finished that draft, I just knew I'd stuck it. I'd nailed it. I had mm. nailed it. I got everything that had to be there in there. And now in seven more days, right? Yep. It's going to be out there. It's going to be on yeah. the loose. And I'm tremendously excited because in some ways, all the adversity and all of the lack of editorial oversight that I had to work through and do so much, it's brought this vision to to fruition with a, a purity of concept. Mm -hmm. that early fame or early attention or too much control over it might have bent it awry. Oh, oh, think about how the public industry has changed. Like if it was, uh, if it was a rocket, right, there would be so many fingers in that pie. Well, there telling... would, I mean, the internet was just getting going in the late nineties and I saw a lot of it. I just had to stop my ears and rebel by writing Hell's Chasm. And say, look, <laughs> 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 I can do this. This is not yeah. out of control. And especially when the tipping point of the series is at Peril's Gate, because that is where the huge departure from traditional fantasy is going to. And it will have been there all along. Just your prejudices and your assumptions would not let you see it. And that's book five? Seven. Seven. Five. And, okay. Uh, let me all see. Right. Um, well, one, two, and three should have been two. So four, five, yes, book five. Book five. Okay. All right. So five or six, one of those. It's I'm going to ask of book three. <laughs> I'm gonna, you've said a couple times, and I know you've heard this, and I know it's com categorically not true. Women can't write epic fantasy. Now, help me, other than starting of War of Light and Shadows and, and, bringing in some other Janny Word standalones that I know there are a couple that I can do uh, before 2025. And I'm trying to line up some other booktubers with me uh, so we can make a bigger thing. And I'm hoping you'll speak to us as we go through this. Sure. Okay. What are some of the women I need to expand my horizons? I'm going to write them down right now. I, Robin Hobb is already on my list. Read Carol and Terry's Fortress in the Eye of Time. Okay. And there are sequels, and she never got a chance to finish. The, it's framed as two trilogies. She never finished the second one. Okay. She That series died when HarperCollins merged with Avon and never got picked up. Um, Read Inda by Sherwood Smith. Okay. At least the first two volumes. Okay. Um, more recently, Jen Lyons. Though okay. I only read her first book, but I gave her a very nice quote. Okay. Um, and understand that women get erased. Back when Ursula Le Guin was writing, and she was using a very Taoist foundation, there were there was more acceptance because science fiction and fantasy were niche. Mm -hmm. So when C.J. Cherry got her start, there wasn't this misogyny that is now. Not at all. It was much different. Women were coding, they were gaming, they were writing, and they were in the middle of it. And then the internet took hold and then things went more mainstream. Star Wars made a big hit and then George Martin made a big hit. We brought in a lot of the major prejudices or, or outside attitudes. As the genre expanded, we picked up some of the fleas. <laughs> but if you think back, Mary Shelley wrote Frankenstein at 16 years old and she invented science fiction. Mm hmm. Yes. The very first novel ever written that they could trace back was some woman in Egypt. Really? Thousands of years know. ago. Yes. The woman who inspired Sherlock Holmes, Kate, Kate, somebody, she she inspired Sherlock Holmes. Mm. Annie McCaffrey was the first woman to make the Times list, mm. whether science fiction or fantasy, depending which way you look at Pern. Mm hmm. Why are these names not out there with Asimov, Highland, Herbert? Mm -hmm. 
go do an experiment for yourself and add up the top 10 lists from all your favorite booktubers and look at the ratio. And that's that's exactly what I'm saying. I don't I I want to do my absolute best. No, but I'm saying go look at what's being talked about. Yeah. It is 80-90% male. Oh, at least 90. I bet at least 90. And then go look at reviews. Mhm. How many people and me, myself included, absolutely love Guy K's prose. Mm-hmm. Read a paragraph of his prose and lay it down against some of the women who write prose, Anna Sparksmith or some of the people that are known for beautiful prose writing. And then look at the reviews and why are they slammed so hard for it? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What does it take to overcome the women aren't supposed to? So, you know, there are women writing this stuff out there. But it's being buried. It's being lost. Um, if you read R.M. Melick, you probably never heard of her. A book called mm-hmm. Jerusalem Fire. Okay. Incredible story about a general who goes out with his massive army and defeats the enemy and realizes he's the bad guy. Oh, wow. And then rebels and goes nameless and joins the resistance powerful story it's called jerusalem fire powerful story it's totally unknown go read the marrow tree by katie waitman it's all about cultural appropriation when a culture is dead and what happens to the people who try to revive concepts that are a threat Uh. to the major and it's brilliantly written but nobody's heard of it and that was launched as a special title it was given every treatment to be a success because the concepts in it were so powerful and it failed. It failed. Why? Hmm. So I don't understand, you know, why some of these books are not, I mean, you want to read a book about a realistic approach to a female warrior where the mentor, the Asian, you know, sensei mentor trains a woman to fight. And says, you can't beat your male opponents this way, this way, or this way. So we're going to make you a, a, a champion archer. And it's a realistic, it's called The Paladin. And it was written by C.J. Cherry. And it's one of the most wonderful views of a female warrior. And how did Carolyn know how to do this? Because she fenced with male opponents who had not mm. enough people to do a pay. So she had to fence a pay against men. Yeah, yeah. So there's incredible. Read read Ellen Kushner's Swords Point. Okay, Ellen Kushner. There's another one. Read Judith Tarr's Crown and Falcon series that is fantasy taking place in the Crusades. Okay. Um, or or her historical where she takes King John of England and makes him the inheritor of the magic, and King Richard is the bad guy. Which historically he was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. So you know she's a PhD historian. Why aren't her works? put up there with the other guys who are PhD scientists writing science fiction. But Judith has changed her byline once and got buried by bookstore death spiral. And she's still writing. Mm. A lot of these women are still alive and they're still writing. Mm. So why haven't we heard of them? Why aren't these books being read, you know? And so I can't figure it. I spent a great deal of my time trying to, Shake People Up, and a lot of books written by men also. Um, Killer by David Drake. And, um, oh, horror writer, what's his name? He wrote the original sort of male gladiator beast trapper going after alien that's got loose in Rome, is parasiting the Roman populace, and it was the inspiration for Predator. Oh, wow. Okay. I have to look that up. It's, he, he collaborated. The name slipped my mind right now. It's a, it's a pretty famous horror writer. Um, or his, uh, what was it? David Drake also wrote a humorous Arthurian. Um, it's Fire Lord? No. I'd have to go up to the loft to get the title. But, you know, so there's tremendous treasures being buried. Yeah. By just because they were midless titles that didn't have a big enough advance, didn't have the huge treatment, didn't get the amount of marketing. They were popped out there and then they disappeared. And because it was pre internet, there's no record of them. Mm. Okay. 
I got marching orders. I'm gonna do. Well, I'm gonna do I my absolute best. I could destroy your TBR for life. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so easily. Yeah. Well, you know, it's already a mountain. I don't think you, you could. I, you know, you. It's. I've given up wrangling it at this point. I just love adding names to it that I can look up and add because you know I. Uh, Dragon Lord, that was David Drake's humorous Arthurian. The okay. and Killer and Dragon Lord are really, really quick, short reads. They're they're fast. I like those. Okay, I can squeeze those in anytime. Okay, you know, you want to read a book about rigid, rigid prejudice and um, just go read P.L. Stewart's Drowned Kingdom. I, I, I have him on my. He's the nicest guy in the world. Well, I have him on my he list. He deals with some heavy themes in those books, and it, the bigotry that he writes about so convincingly with his character that's so flawed. Oh wow! Okay, okay. and it's so well done. Um, so I could just keep listing books and books and books. Yeah, you know the subgenre of transcendental fantasy, which Philip Chase is writing in, which an author you've never heard of, Paige Christie, is writing in her Tales of Arnan. Page powerful, okay. powerful books. Um, R.A. McAvoy also delved into transcendental fantasy long before, and her books have virtually vanished. Okay. Well, I'm finishing Philip's trilogy next month. So we'll have that done. Yep. And you'll see what I'm talking about, but then read Paige Christie and read R.A. McAvoy and go, there's a whole subgenre here yeah. that hasn't even been scratched. And of course, the word of light and shadows was um, Alan Chibipo was the one who coined that term really? for okay. that series and other books fit into it. And so I've been kind of going, yeah, there's other books yeah. on this list. Yeah. That I'm not, people, I'm not alone. <laughs> people enjoy this. Um, there are other authors who are, who are delving into this. Love it. Jenny. And I think they're particularly up your alley because some of your experiences maybe yeah. have been a little off outside the envelope. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, yeah, I don't think you can live in L.A. for 10 years without going a little bit outside the envelope. So I, I spent I spent my time there. Uh, but I, I, I tell you, I love the spiritual search as a, as a theme, uh, because I think that's there's there's very little that's more important than that. You know, to tr and the cultural angles that can lead into that. I've been very, very fortunate in some of the people that I've been privileged enough to meet and talk to that were not from my upbringing and not from my culture and not from my background that I was able to. And so some of that gets mixed into the writing as well. Sure. Um, so I've been really lucky on my travels to have encountered some very, very incredible individuals. Well, I have been lucky to encounter some incredible individuals, and I have to tell you, you top that list, Janny Words. I, I can't tell you what it has meant to me to spend the time this evening that you have given me. I can't tell you uh, the generousness of your spirit, what it's been to my entire family. And uh, I just, uh, I, I just will say this: I hope this is the first chat of many starting in twenty twenty five. When we get our group together that is going to start going through of War and Light and Shadows, I hope we can tap you on the shoulder and have many, many more chats. It'd be my pleasure because it's been a very solo effort for decade after decade <laughs> after decade. So finding the people that can share that experience and that I can leave a record of the insights that went into it, it's a privilege. It's honestly a privilege. I honestly thought it wasn't going to happen. Well, I... I, I look, look. You, here's the thing: when art is outside of time, that it you will be caught up to. It will happen. I know that it's timeless, and I know I made an effort to make these books timeless. Hell's Chasm is not locked into the current trend. It's not locked into the current lexicon. It's not even locked into the popular style of the English language that writers are using to quote, quote, make the books more accessible. I want the books to be accessible outside of time. And I stretched myself to the limit to make that happen. The prose is gorgeous. It's not, yes, it's not easily digestible when you think about- Wait a minute. It's, it's simple if you slow down that's that's what exactly what I was going to say. 
people will say, oh, this is so easily digest, but that means, look, you can't skim it. You can't just skim through this, but you would not want to. The trick is that you want to deliver an experience. Yes. You don't want to deliver a popcorn. And, and I read popcorn reads on airplanes and on the beach or when I'm overstressed. I love sure. them. I have my comfort reads where I don't want to stretch my mind. Absolutely. But if you want to deliver an experience that's going to be seared into your mind, that you're going to remember that book long after it's finished. You have to slow down the brain process because yeah. memory works. Your brain slows down. If you're doing something you really love, you're in the moment. And to put your mind in the moment on the printed page, you have to stop skimming. Yes. You have to slow the mind, slow the reading pace down so that the experience can sink in. And those are the books that are going to last. If you read a Guy K book, you can't skim it. No. Absolutely. But you can yeah. remember those books 20, 25 years after they yes. were written. I know because I read them that long ago. <laughs> I know that when I read a historical by Edith Pargeter, who wrote The Heaven Tree That Beats the Heck Out of Pillars of the Earth. Oh, I'm right. That Heaven's Tree? Oh, okay. my God. It's beautiful. It's emotional. It's fiery. It has characters that are so multifaceted. It's not the cheap shot. Um. The Heaven Tree trilogy that she wrote, or if I read a Dorothy Dummett book, I will remember those books decades yeah. later, decades well, later in fine tuned detail. Yeah. Not every book can do that, but those are the books that I want to write. But those are the books that do make you slow down. Look, I think books are that magical conduit between you and another place, another time, another person, another reality. And if you open your mind up and you slow down just enough, it's a shortcut to compassion and empathy and sympathy in ways that nothing else is because you walk in that character's shoes. That's why Mikhail's my guy, because I will carry a part of Mikhail now until they throw dirt on me. Right. There's, but the there's, trick there's, is we're living in a soundbite society. So in order to create a book like that, you're going a bit against the grain. Well... Here's but I'm, I'm okay Instagram. with that. If I'm writing for the outsider, if I'm writing for the maverick, if I'm writing for the person that's lonely and has no place to think, if I'm writing for the person that's shut in by yes. their worldly circumstance and they want doors to really open, I want these books to last. And so, you know, some writers say I'd rather be lucky than good. I would rather be good. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love that you write outsiders for the outsiders or for anyone that will take the time to read them and everyone should. And that's why I say this is art outside of time and time is going to catch up to it. There, I have no doubt in my mind. And if anyone is within the sound of my voice, they are always going to be on my, th this one particularly, I haven't read the other ones, but I, I have no doubt about that either. They're going to be on my favorite list that I repeat over and over again. Um, so, Janie, thank you so much for giving me the time. Oh, thank you for asking me. It's truly a privilege. And if if I get to see these books take, well, I'm still looking at the green side of the grass, it will be because of the love and enthusiasm shown by this community, honestly. Because well, they're carrying it right now, and and the connections can happen. That potential is always there. And you guys are critical to that. And I'm grateful to my last breath that you're here for me right now oh. and sharing this triumphant moment when this huge series has finally come in off the printing press. I, it is just such an amazing, I can't wait for January. And I know it'll be here like that because, you know, that's just how time works for me these days. Uh, but I've got, I've got one taker already. I'm going to get, try get at least a couple more. Uh, so we can get more and more outreach on more and more channels. And we're going to go through uh, this series together, a book every other month. And I cannot wait to talk to you about it. And I can't wait to take this journey. Here's the trick for you. I do not write cliffhangers, even in the series. The story arc of each book is going to complete. And it's going to gear by the arc finishes. Okay. So expect that the first book sets the stage. The second book is going to truly hook you into the conflict and the characters beyond question. That So you can almost read that first three as a trilogy. Then you're going to be raised to worldview. 
and all okay. the stakes and all the factions and where they're really coming from and what you thought was their moral high ground isn't mm. what you necessarily assumed. And then you're going to step off the brink. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Love it. Love it. And the last two arcs, four and five, are almost a trilogy in themselves also because the finale pulls it all from the very, very start. And then the fun part is each time you complete an arc, if you go back and look at the events, you're going to realize how much was on the page that you stepped right over because your own prejudice, your own assumptions, your own thinking you knew it all, your mm -hmm. own preconceived blinded you yeah. to what was actually there. Oh, and that ripping off of the veil will happen all the way through to the final book and the final page. I, I cannot wait to talk to you about every step of it, if you're willing. Totally. Totally. <laughs> and, you Jane, know, Hell's Chasm is a good starting point because that's kind of a microcosm. It I, isn't going to go I, as wide or as deep, but it's got all the makings that you'll yeah. see. And I, that's why I know I'm going to love War and Light and Shadow so much because I absolutely adored this book. It, it was well, such a great read for me. Thank you. That's so wonderful to hear. Thank you for your Jan time, John. And oh, Janie. I, thank you, know you too. What? Is it Joseph? Thank you to Joseph for being Jake, your Jacob, uh, he's right here. Fabulous technician. He'll come in and wave. Thank it's, you to it, your I, wife I, who's keeping the dogs company. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'll go wake her up right now. Thank, thank Don for giving you up for this. Uh, I, I, I always tell people, like uh, all those years doing theater, I know the hours away from my family and the toll it took. I always like to thank everybody that spends some time with me. Please give your family a kiss and thank them from me for giving you up for a little bit of time. I will do that. Jenny, until the next time, which I hope is very soon. Until next time. <laughs> <laughs>